Good afternoon. My name is Tsenia Kunalaki. I'm foreign editor at the Kathimerini newspaper based in Athens, Greece. And I'll be moderating our next roundtable on transatlantic relations in the Biden era. Uh, our speakers today are Maria de Merzis, deputy director at the Bruegel in Belgium. Uh, Daniela Schwarzer, current executive director for Europe and Eurasia at the Open Society Foundations. Constance Stelzenmüller, Fritz uh, Stern Chair at the Center uh, at the Brookings Institution in the U.S., and Sir Nicholas Soames, President of the Conservative Middle East Council and Senior Advisor at the FMA Partners in the U.K. So I'll give the floor to each of you in the beginning for an opening statement of, let's say, two to three minutes uh, about the current state of transatlantic, transatlantic relations in the post-Trump era, and we can take some questions. Uh, the floor is yours, Maria de Merdiz. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Xenia. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I wanted to make uh, three quick points on the economic agenda that pertains to the Biden administration and what it means for Europe. On the domestic side, uh, I am really delighted to see that there is a lot going on uh, trying to resolve the economic impact uh, of the pandemic, really massive stimulus that are coming uh, in 2021 to try and sustain economic value. So this is excellent news and it will mean something for Europe as well. I'll come back to that. On the foreign agenda, uh, there are really three issues that are going on which are very encouraging from our side. Uh, the return to climate discussions, which are, of course, uh, very important and very dear to the European hearts. So we are delighted to see that the Biden administration is really very committed to make progress on climate issues. Um, then uh, the issue of corporate taxation and how to try and maintain a global level playing field when it comes uh, to corporate power. Uh, here, the Biden administration is also coming in with very potent suggestions that I think are going to make a difference at the global scene. So that is also is going to be a real step forward as we move ahead. And then the last economic issue is the trade issues and the multilateral system. There, I think the news are less good. Uh, we have not seen the Biden administration differentiate itself uh, from the Trump administration, at least not to the extent that we would have hoped for. Uh, well, I, I don't know whether this is uh, a political choice or whether this is an issue of priorities, but I think on the world trade uh, issues, uh, we would like to see a lot more uh, happening. And of course, with the most important thing being the revival of the World Trade Organization which is crucial for the multilateral system. So uh, my last point is on Europe, uh, very good news. Uh, a U.S. administration that has been a lot more silent than the previous administration, but a lot more convincing in terms of coming back to help resolve important global issues and setting a stage for global cooperation that is really encouraging. I'll stop here. So, Daniela, is America back or not? What do you think? What is your take? America is certainly back, but of course in its own ways. So. I, let me start by commenting on, on the huge opportunity that we now have. And that is indeed, um, as has just been said, we have a joint agenda on many issues. And this is a totally different situation than we had a year back when transatlantic issues were also discussed at, at the Delphi Forum. So now there is a US president who is a declared multilateralist who embraces the fight against climate change, who, who uh, looks at uh, the world in a way that he doesn't want polarized, but he wants to bring in particular the democracies together. Um, but he has a very clear issue that he has identified just like his predecessor, and that is China, a rising world power. And uh, the US have a particular view and expectations uh, towards the Europeans how to deal with China. And here I come to the European side of things. Um, Europe has evolved greatly uh, over the past two years in its assessment of what China is. 
China is, of course, a business partner uh, in terms of trade and investment, but it's also a systemic competitor to the US and to Europe. Uh, it is an tech, a tech-based autocracy that really tries to spread its model uh, across the world by now. And from a European perspective, we are, of course, keenly aware that this is happening in our close neighborhood and that China intervenes even within the European Union. That brings me to the last big topic that I wish to raise in this very brief introductory statement, and that is uh, the state of democracy, both in the US and in Europe. The past years in the US from a European perspective were, of course, troubling, and in particular, uh, the, um, the events uh, in January um, and uh, you know the, the protests and uh, the march on the capital and the pol political violence that could be seen then. So the concerns in Europe, of course, very big that the democracy in the US has its instabilities. And of course, President Biden will do what he can to increase uh, the resilience of the democratic system in the US. And Europeans have to work very closely with the United States on issues of democracy because we ourselves within the European Union, we have backsliding countries. So this exchange on what needs to be done from a political, but also from a socio-economic perspective to make liberal democracy resilient in this world. I think this is a key topic that is a matter of conversation between Europe and the US on the one hand, but also when we think together about the role of the transatlantic partners in the world. Constance, you heard your European colleagues uh, commenting on uh, the expectations of uh, Brussels uh, from the Biden presidency. Uh, give us uh, the American view. Well, obviously, I, I, I have to say um, I am a German myself. So I'm speaking here as a German from Washington. I also want to say I'm really not at all delighted uh, to be speaking to you in this, in this way. I mean, I am delighted to be here with you, but I had much rather be in Greece, frankly. I'm very uh, miffed that we are, that we're having to do this online still. Now, as to your question, um, I think it's at this point already incontrovertible that the Biden administration is astoundingly thoroughly prepared for its program of domestic renovation. And there, we're already seeing growth rates of 7% here, while Europe is in a double dip recession, I think. Um, that number already tells us a great deal. Um, that said, I have doubts on, on two points. Um, yes, much of this is, is good for Europe. And I think American growth rates could be good for Europe as well, given how deeply we are enmeshed with each other economically. But the truth is that the, there are some sort of wobbles in, in the administration's policies, if you look closely. And one of those wobbles concerns Europe. And you saw it most clearly, I think, in the rather tentative and not particularly coherent reactions to the bullying behavior by Vladimir Putin. Uh, the president calling Vladimir Putin a killer, but then offering him a summit, um, taking, I thought, uh, far too long to react to the um, um, massing of 100,000 troops and tanks uh, on the Ukraine border. Um, and that, I think, shows that there is some uncertainty, strategic uncertainty, in the minds of this administration with regard to the future stability of the Eurasian continent. And actually, if you look closely, the same is true for Europe. The administration, I think, is has made it very clear it wants to work with Europe. It is for the European Union. It is embracing all of us. It is particularly embracing the Germans. Thank you very much. But I don't think it has a very specific sense of what kind of Europe it wants and what the potential different futures are, the development paths for continental Europe, its relationship with the UK, its relationship with America, its relationship with Russia and China, and what it needs to do or encourage in Europe in order to, to promote the better futures and um, deter the worst ones. And there I think um, we have to ourselves come up 
with ideas, with proposals. And I think, frankly, we're hanging back. We're all far too introverted because of the economic crisis, the pandemic, and our upcoming elections. And I would say that particularly for Germany, which has elections on September 26th, and which I think is um, unconscionably passive in the face of what are I think very generous overtures from Washington. And I'll stop there. We'll come back to that, to uh, the German elections uh, and what impact the elections will have uh, on Europe and the relationship to the US. Uh, I will come to you, Sir Nicholas. Uh, you're not, your country is not part of uh, the EU anymore, so uh, we have to talk about your country as a different part of uh, the of the continent so i would like to uh, uh, listen to your take uh, on the special relationship uh, of the us and the uk in the biden era well <clears throat> first of all it's quite clear thank you much indeed for asking me it's a great privilege to be at the delphi forum although i agree with constance it would be much nicer to be there in person um i i i um First of all, multilateralism, as Daniela said, is clearly back and very much back. Um, I think the question of what Europe, of what America expects of Europe, I think really ought to be put on the other foot is what does Europe expect of itself in, in the role it's going to play? But I think it is extraordinary to observe our world of 2020 from the turn of the century. I mean, the rise of China, the expansion of the internet, the proliferation of technologies, They've all gravely challenged the Western security as we knew it, and thus paved the way for global competition, which is now so obvious over values, trade, and ideologies. And I so take the point that I think it's a pity that we haven't got further on trade. But I personally have never been, I grew up in an age of great certainty in international affairs, really. And I've never been so personally perplexed about where the world is heading. It seems to me that all these the geopolitics in which we all lived and grew up across uh, across the world are deeply broken. Uh, the global order, which has done us all so well, is not only fragmenting, and I'm praying that the Biden uh, leadership will bring this back together again, but becoming deeply, and in some areas, uh, dangerously contested. And it remains to be seen, I think, uh, of whether Western-led international relations are going to prevail and in my view, we are greatly, generally unprepared in what this will look like as the world goes ahead in conducting its business at such an extraordinary time. I mean, inevitably, unavoidable competition has to allow room for real cooperation on global policy issues such as China, climate change and the pandemics. And these huge challenges can only be dealt with with the spirit of cooperation. And, and to that extent, I greatly welcome the the, the way that the Biden administration have clearly decided that this is way ahead. And it's very welcome to see the importance of the work of the G7 and the G20 as cooperation returns. But what is, I think, vital is that the West generally adopts greater consistency in all its dealings. We're a bit, we were inevitably under President Trump, a bit all over the place. But what's needed in all this and in the contested areas is a set of policies, economic, security, diplomatic and military, that all point in the same direction. Because if we don't have that, we really won't be able to deal effectively with China in particular. There isn't any magic formula. There will always be tremendous tensions between strategic rivalry and economic independence. But every day it becomes clear that there is an endless environment for the most active diplomacy which we can muster between us with clear objectives to sustain the liberal order under which the world has done so well. Thank you. So we all agree that America is back with, but with some reservations, as Maria mentioned. Maria, if you had to state a challenge, the main challenge uh, for the transatlantic relations, what would that be? China, I guess, Russia, uh, the climate change? <laughs> Yeah, um, since you asked me to choose, uh, <laughs> I really have to choose one, right? Uh, look, I'm optimistic on, on climate and even on the pandemic when it comes down to the level of global operation. I think incentives are aligned, thinking is aligned, and quite frankly, patience is also aligned. 
When it comes to China, however, I think this is really the elephant in the room. Um, we don't necessarily all think the same way. I mean, just start with Europe. Europe doesn't have one position on China, despite the CHI, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, I think, which, by the way, I don't think will pass. But in any case, I don't think that Europeans think the same way on China, not because they disagree, but actually they haven't made their minds up. Here, there is a very big difference uh, with the US, who has a very clear idea of what they want from China and what they don't want from China. So I think that's going to be the big thing to, uh, to meet. And quite frankly, I'm not entirely optimistic uh, as to what the end game is going to be. Uh, there is really two different schools of thought here when it comes to the way that we operate. China has a way of doing things, and let, if I may call it the Western model, has got another way of doing things. There's a lot to disagree with in the US, but on principles and uh, on sort of the big picture, I think we agree with the US. Um, but uh, with China, I think there are fundamental differences. And I remind also that China is a, a huge country with huge potential. Uh, China is going to want to write the global rule book. It will want to hold the pen when this new global rule book is being written. And, and exactly what type of ink it will put in this book is not obvious to me. I know what I want. I certainly want multilateral to be uh, the solution. It's the only way to have good solutions and sustainable in the long run. But but I'm not clear how we're going to get there. And the same question, what about you? What do you think the main challenge is? I would agree that it is China. And without wanting to repeat anything, I will just add to what, what Europe, in my view, needs to do. Maria pointed out that on China, there's no one EU position, although I think the framing of the China debate uh, is today in Europe far more consistent than it was 18 or 24 months ago in a more realistic assessment of the challenge that China poses. Um, so what Europe needs to do, in my view, is two things. One, it has to see the China challenge in its, in its uh, region. And here, some of the EU member states have already moved ahead with uh, developing strategies on the Indo-Pacific. And again, China is always the elephant in the room, sometimes not even mentioned in the strategic papers. Um, and here, the EU has to, has to develop a coherent approach also because uh, Joe Biden has reached out to key players uh, in the region and is developing formats to have a strategic dialogue with players there. And Europe should, of course, be able to be part of this conversation. The second thing that Europe has to do is, in particular, when we look at the challenge that China combined with technological progress and digitization poses uh, to the Western liberal world. It is really uh, this necessity for Europe to invest heavily into its own technological advancement um, and work together with partners, be they, in, be they in the US or be they, be they in other places, to be competitive and to be a key player on leading new technologies, because that is the only way that Europe can continue to act as a global standard setter and regulator. Why is this so important? Not only for questions of economic competitiveness, but because we more and more that China's global expansion strategy includes a tech element which, is, which it uses to also spread its own governance model, which is an autocratic one. And uh, the evidence that is now being produced by researchers how uh, China exports uh, technology combined really with uh, you know, with know-how, how to use that technology for surveillance um, in countries that are either autocracies or, or maybe want to move towards that. I think that is the real challenge that Europe and the US have to look at together. And Europe, frankly, has to be far a stronger player, a far more competitive player in the area of technology. And that's why we need to invest, but we won't be able to do it alone. So it's a key topic for the transatlantic agenda. Constance, uh, do you see uh, ambivalence uh, of Europe vis-à-vis uh, -vis China, as was mentioned, uh, and uh, that it, it's not uh, harsh enough? Uh, we remember last autumn uh, Merkel hosting a summit with China, uh, so I guess uh, Washington wasn't very happy with that. Look, um, 
And I don't want to go over what uh, Maria and Daniela have just said. Um, frankly, I, th I think the, the Chinese European Investment Agreement, um, while the timing and the symbolism was, I think, profoundly unhelpful, uh, in no way stands in the way of a desperately necessary larger strategic conversation between Washington, Brussels and European national capitals. That's a simple fact. Everybody knows that. Um, what I do see is a sort of hanging back in Europe and in my own country, Germany, um, an argument uh, which is America wants us to decouple and we can't do that because that would be economically suicidal. Actually, I, I think that's not correct. Um, the China hawks here are pretty hawkish, but as Daniela said, the 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 take on on what China is doing in Europe every day with technological, political, economic um, propaganda means um, has gotten pretty close to what the hawks here think. What we do need to do is to manage this interdependence, which by the way also exists for the American side. In other words, there are things that where we were going to need to work with the Chinese as well as with the Russians, but preferably obviously on our terms and not on theirs. And so what we need to be able to do is um, increase resilience, diversify our supply chains, um, walk back certain national security relevant technologies uh, to make them less open to interference by authoritarian powers, that kind of thing. And there is a great deal of overlap of interests and a, and a great deal of urgency. Um, that's where the real work needs to be done. And then I think a lot of other things sort of will fall into place. But I think if you, you know, if you keep talking about cooperating with the Chinese on climate change, but fail to do this other stuff, uh, then you're opening yourselves to misreadings in Beijing and Moscow. And I would say that the current, um, I think, overreactions in both capitals, the slapping out on of harsh counter sanctions, by, both by the Russians and the Chinese, I think suggests that um, the both Moscow and Beijing are acting from a position of weakness. The, these are the, these are counter reactions that are actually putting the Europeans and the Americans closer together. But I'll finish with it. my final flourish is that this sort of misreading of Europe and this sort of the weakness that this suggests. My Ch my my China expert colleagues here at Brookings say. You know, Xi Jinping doesn't actually have people around him who t who occasionally tell him that he's making mistakes. Um, Vladimir Putin is clearly acting from a position of growing insecurity, but that too presents enormous challenges for America and for Europe that I don't think we've we've really factored into our strategic analysis at all. Sir Nicholas, uh, Anthony Blinken was in London recently and uh, Russia was a topic there since uh, Constance brought uh, Putin and Russia into our debate. Uh, what do you think? Uh, is, it, is uh, Russia an equal uh, problem for the transatlantic relations as China or a lesser one? Well it's a different sort of problem. I, I, I actually think that, um, and I, I thought that um, Secretary Blinken's visit was a, 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 seemed to me to be a great success. Uh, but of course, the Americans will inevitably become increasingly irritated with Europe, as they inevitably do, if Europe cannot itself uh, find a suitable position, which they can roughly call a joint position, on both China and indeed on Russia. And Therefore, the, it seems to me that the only thing, and, and, and I thought the Constance put it very well about the whole range of issues that need to be dealt with, but it seems to me that the only way in which we can have a concerted effort uh, on all these things is through, through climate change and the need for uh, China uh, to find a proper way to deal with China. Uh, Russia, I'm afraid, is in the kind of mood where it will continue to plunge a stick into the eye of the West on every possible opportunity it can. It'll push us as far as it possibly can. 
and um, like one of your panelists who said it, I thought it was a, a pity that America took so long to react to the very serious build-up of troops on the Ukrainian border. So, you know, it's a different it's a different kind of problem, but it would be helped if America's part. It would help America if America's partners, in particular in Europe, could come up with a common position that would enable everyone to speak with one voice on such an important and serious problem. Sir Nicholas uh, mentioned the lack of uh, a common European common stance, uh, Maria de Merzis. And uh, now we're, we will have elections in Germany uh, in September, uh, very crucial elections. We see the polls bringing the Greens, uh, putting them in first place. So we might have a totally different uh, uh, government in Berlin. Uh, what do you think? Uh, will the EU be equally strong uh, and a very respected uh, ally to the US uh, with a leader less strong than uh, Merkel? A, a very loaded question, actually. A far bit for me to uh, to comment on, on, on or to try and predict what's going to happen in the German elections. Um, I think I would like to echo some of the things that uh, my colleagues have said when it comes to Europe and one voice. I think what makes Europe uh, a strong uh, partner is, the, is, is when it speaks with one voice. We had a very unfortunate incident a few weeks ago in Turkey where we, started, we had an exhibition of exactly the weakness of Europe when it doesn't speak with one voice. And you actually see that we have achieved the best results when we really had one common position. It's not easy to get to a common position on all the issues that were raised. Uh, but when we do do that, uh, then uh, we, we do manage to, to, to achieve great results. So, you know, I dare say more than great leadership, we need to find ways of agreeing on positions because when we do, we do actually achieve, uh, achieve a lot. So I would argue that uh, Europe would always be and will always require certain uh, Franco-German leadership. I think that's important. There are big countries. And here, dare I say, the UK has a role to play as well as a big diplomatic nation. Alas, outside the EU now, but in any case, uh, it is a country that can offer uh, uh, to intermediate when, when, when intermediation is requested. So leadership, there will always be demand for good uh, captains of the wheel. And here the Franco Germans are the size of the, uh, because they are big countries and because they're historically important in Europe, they have a role to play. And therefore that will be important. Uh, not forget that it's not enough. We need to get all countries on board for a strong Europe. You cannot have the small countries left behind that creates a lot of animosity, it threatens democracy, as Daniela has also said. So it's important that everybody's on board and leadership is exactly this, getting everybody on board, not promoting one on own positions necessarily. So I think uh, to answer your question we need agreement on as many issues as we possibly can with as many possible countries as we can and only then Europe is at its best. Daniela Maria mentioned uh, the sofa gate uh, this uh, very bad example of uh, <laughs> lack of common stance uh, which happened in Ankara, a very unfortunate incident. Uh, do you think we will have uh, more of that in the post merkel era? Look, Selfagate uh, was nothing that has to do with who leads Germany at the moment. It, it shows us something quite interesting and, and uh, worrisome. And that is that uh, countries that are on the one hand our partners but who are also players that want to book us um, Russia or in that case Turkey uh, they use any possible opportunity to exploit and display uh, possible European weaknesses um, just like the press conference uh, with uh, the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov and the high representative Josep Borrell showed so this tells us something about the world out there. And now within that world, there's the European Union. And you wanted to have a comment on, 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 on the German leadership. So Angela Merkel had been an exceptional chancellor for a very, very long time. So not only the European Union and Germany have become entirely used to her style, uh, but also uh, in Atlantic relations. Merkel has been a constant variable over, over such a long time. Now, 
there will be a change of leadership in Germany, that's for sure. But I think it would be wrong to assume that automatically uh, we would have a weak chancellor after that. And that was somewhat uh, in your question. We will have a new chancellor, but democratic change has to be possible in those systems. And what we will see on some issues uh, will be a lot of continuity um, in, in, in the German foreign policy and European policy. Why? because the German system and far beyond uh, the political and foreign policy thinking, but also our economic approach to things, our economic growth model is highly dependent on close European integration. So the single market and single currency, which are both greatly beneficial to Germany. So there's a high likelihood that this will be uh, a, a prime concern for any government coming into, uh, into power this coming fall. Um, on other issues that are more related to uh, security and defense, of course, a strong green participation will bring different positions and different nuances to the discussion. Uh, those will be um, crucially important, not only for Europe, but also for the transatlantic relationship. And let me add just one point, um, because I hear a lot of concern about the German elections. I wish to add the French elections to those concerns, because if we see a change in leadership in Germany, that's foreseeable. And, and I think, yeah, there will be some surprises, but there will also be a lot of continuity. France, in my view, is the country to watch uh, in the first half of 2022, because Emmanuel Macron, who started his first five year term as a, as a really convinced European who never got a substantive re response from Germany, although there was, of course, close Franco-German cooperation over the past years, we will see how he will position himself in the next presidential elections. France holds the EU presidency and has a lot of ambition for that. And it will really be up to the new leader in Germany and the leader in France. We don't know whether it's uh, Macron or someone else. And the alternatives are not really reassuring. Uh, there will be a big job to do for the Franco-German, uh, the Franco-German couple to develop ideas and to onboard the other countries. As Maria has said, they won't be able to move anything in the EU alone. So what we need is a really broad dialogue. I would start from the strategic issues that the EU is facing in a world which is rapidly changing at this moment. Constance, uh, was your, what is your take on German elections and uh, French elections? Well, I, I, I confess year? that I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a tad more worried both about the French and the Germans. Um, I think that, uh, let me start with, with our neighbours. I think that President Macron is a, is, you know, would have made an extremely good think tanker, but is a less than persuasive politician. And he's currently running neck neck with Marine Le Pen and trying to overtake her on the right. Um, that's a recipe that German politicians have tried. Most famously, the minister president of Bavaria in an election in, in a state election in 2018, which cost him the holy grail, the crown jewels of Bavarian politics, the absolute majority of the CSU, the Bavarian sister party of the Christian Democrats. That's normally the end of a Bavarian politician's career. Um, instead of which, Mr. Zuda um, reinvented himself as a much greener, kind of more centrist cons uh, conservative, and I think is still a serious uh, frenemy to the current leader of the of the German Conservatives. The other thing, frankly, I worry about uh, is is this uh, petition published by by retired French and, and current French officers, generals, in fact. Um, suggesting that uh, unless the country was ruled with a harder hand um, that uh, you know needed to be that there might be a civil war um, that's frankly as insurrectionist a piece of paper as has come out of of, of france in a very long time and um, fr current french polls suggest that a majority of french citizens support it which is astounding um, and would be um, a serious spanner in the works if for, for any German government. And as for the German government, I mean, I, I think, look, of course, I wish we had term limits. I, I have great respect for Angela Merkel, much as I see 
um, her weaknesses and the mistakes she made. But um, I don't think it's healthy for any democracy for to have the same leader four terms in a row. Um, and what we have now is, frankly, a weak conservative leader polling neck to neck with a an attractive, laser focused, very energetic young green leader who, however, doesn't have any executive experience. I'm inclined to give her the benefit of the doubt, um, but there are a lot of sort of factors in current German politics that make me think that German politics might be quite inward looking, not least because the likelihood that we would have a three way coalition um, is quite high. And we saw in the last election, 2017, that it took, you know, all of five months to negotiate that. And if that happens this time around, it'll be happening at the same time as the French elections, which is presumably unhelpful for anybody who expects leadership from Europe. About all these developments in Europe, I mean the, the general's letter, the uh, future elections in Germany, uh, Le Pen uh, leading the way in the first round of the French elections. Uh, and how do all these uh, developments uh, uh, affect the transatlantic relation? Uh, is that, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you at the beginning. Yes, yes sorry. Yes. yes, well, I I completely agree with my colleagues. I mean, you know, I love both France and Germany. I've spent a very great deal of time in both countries. I dislike very much seeing this, this sort of, um, split of insecurity and doubt running through democracy. And one of my colleagues already on this panel has already talked about democracy and its worries. And so I think I um, have great faith in the common sense of both countries. And I hope very much that their people will come to a sensible conclusion, but it would be disastrous for all the things that we have been talking about here um, from a position of a common view on some of these tremendous challenges that we're all facing to see some of the some of the um, potential results that might occur so i hope and pray that this this will not turn out in the way that it looks and, I, and to be frank i think in a in a in a, in, in 2021 it is astonishing to see a letter written by some serving officers and other retired generals actually seeing the light of common day i think that is an, an extraordinary and very serious event and and it merely emphasizes i i mean the point that i tried to inadequately make in my few words at the beginning that i think we are seeing almost inexplicable it's very very difficult to get a handle on where all this is going and to to react but if if we're talking in terms of transatlantic relations America will grow very quickly weary of having to deal with a, a Europe that is completely uh, incapable of coming to common positions on these very, very big issues. And that knocks through, frankly, uh, you know, into NATO. And I don't think that's healthy either. So whilst I applaud the increase in multilateralism, I love hearing Secretary Blinken speaking as he did, and there's tremendous goodwill on all our parts for all of this to work. We really do need to, to be in a place where we are able to, to take this stuff forward in the face of, of the challenge of China and Russia, who are both playing us, frankly, like violins. Maria, we talked about democracy. Uh, let's talk about Turkey, which is of great interest, of course, for Greece and my country, but also for the US and Europe. Uh, what do you think, uh, what is the symbolism of the recognition of the Armenian uh, genocide by Washington? And uh, how does this affect uh, the relationship between the US and Turkey? And also, uh, could it lead to a common stand between uh, e the EU and uh, Washington vis-a-vis -vis Turkey? Well, um... Perhaps I'd, I'd offer um, uh, what I would call an informed opinion rather than expertise on the, on the matter. Um, let me start from, the, from arguing that I don't believe that 
anybody wins, uh, least of all Greece, uh, from uh, and, and a Turkey that is antagonistic and uh, and quite, quite frankly, a treat as an enemy. Uh, the first one to lose will be the neighbors, and that, of course, involves uh, Greece. So I think it's crucial that uh, Europe, for with all its neighbors, and of course, some of the problems we've been discussing has to do with problems of neighboring countries. We need to, to make sure that we, we take, uh, we have in the state, we have a healthy relationship with our neighbors, and that includes Turkey. Now, not at any cost. Uh, there are values here that have been evaluated. There is, you know, as far as Greece is concerned, there are foreign foreign policy issues that are a dispute here, though not at any cost. So I understand that. So with that, uh, it's quite interesting to see uh, the U.S. position when it comes to the Armenian genocide. Um, it, it has been a pre-electoral promise by the administration to recognize that, and it's remarkable that in its first hundred days. Uh, the administration came uh, faithful to its promise. I think that is that is uh, that is wonderful to see. Um, uh, uh, but I also believe that they've done it in a way that is diplomatically very masterful, uh, with great care, trying not to uh, push Turkey more away than it absolutely has to. So the wording of the recognition was very masterfully done, in my view, um, and it far recognized and attributed responsibility to different generations than current ones. I think this is an attempt, a diplomatic attempt to. to to tell us all that it's important that we remain engaged with Turkey, which I, I thoroughly believe, and which I think is also a lesson, if you like, for us Europeans, that we try, we need to continue to talk to Turkey, we need to have a peaceful coexistence, uh, because nobody gains uh, otherwise. And I think that uh, the, the, the current way that it was treated by the administration um, was helpful in this respect. Daniela, we are, we're running out of time, so uh, if you could please be brief uh, on Turkey. I'll try. I, I agree with Maria that we have to balance um, dialogue and then also criticism and and uh, just as the U.S. decision, which from a Tur Turkish perspective will will still, although the wording was diplomatic, will see will be seen as a as a huge occasion. Now, just one element to add to to the mutual dependency of Turkey and the European neighbors is, of course. Uh, the migration situation and the fact that Turkey has signed a deal with the European Union uh, to, to host refugees uh, on its territory uh, and to work with the European Union on this. This deal is, of course, not without, uh, without problematic elements and the human rights perspective has to always be uh, taken as well. But what I wish to say here is that you knows very well that it is dependent on a good relationship with Turkey and at the same time it observes that Turkey expands its influence in, in its own neighborhood. Uh, some of those countries are very unstable and the European Union has a key interest uh, to work with Turkey and Russia and others uh, to stabilize as far as it can uh, in the Middle East, but we all know that this is an extremely difficult endeavor, but not dialoguing with, with Turkey on those issues is simply no option. Constance, what is your opinion on Turkey? Look, I don't, again, I don't want to retread um, the ground that's already been um, been covered. I I want to say this. I know I know that the that Germany is currently um, not very popular. I mean, there's always reasons why Germany is a popular in Greece, but the, the, this particular one is that we are seen as being too close to Turkey on a number of sort of security issues in in the Eastern Mediterranean. I am not entirely sure that that is true. What I do worry about is that we uh, in Berlin tend to sort of cherry pick issues on which we engage and, and sort of don't really think of a region that is as volatile um, as the Eastern Mediterranean as a coherent strategic whole, where we have to take into account all actors and their relationships with us, both on a domestic policy, policy level as far as immigration is concerned, and on the uh, foreign and security policy level. Um, I remember years ago um, asking in Berlin why we didn't talk to the Turks about foreign and security policy and got the answer from a very senior advisor to Angela Merkel that that, that could only be discussed at the very end of the Turkish accession negotiations, which I thought was an astounding uh, an astoundingly misguided answer. And I think uh, explains a great deal about where we are now. 
um, we we do need a coherent approach. We can't leave the Italians alone with the Libyan problem and then sort of, you know, assume that we Germans can swoop in and try to be the good broker at, at a Libya conference. It, that is just not good enough. And uh, likewise, I also would quite like us to see um, us coming down rather more forcefully on Erdogan when he tries to yank Germany's and Europe's chain on issues like refugees and, and other topics. Um, and I'm not saying this to make myself popular in Africa. I think that, that there is, it is just um, the, the take that we have on regional security is just not um, coherent and, and, and far-sighted enough. And we're going to pay a price for that. Arguably, we're paying it now. So, Nicholas, the floor well, is yours. Briefly. You're the last. Thank, thank you. Well, I, I know we're pressed for time, and I'm certainly not going to go over the other ground, but I think that this is the most important case <clears throat> that I can see for far greater diplomatic, uh, active diplomatic effort with with Turkey. I think this is, our conversation has been very EU-centred, and there's nothing wrong with that, but this is a major problem for NATO as well as for the European Union. Um, and I think it goes to the heart of what I believe to be true, which is that if you have a problem country, a country that's causing all of us, we, we don't really know how to deal with it. We do need to come up with a plan that is much more consistent across all the areas which we know are a great worry. And, and to acknowledge that Turkey herself lives in a very, very difficult place. And she is a very important ally and partner. And we have to find a way to do this better. And they have to find a way to do it better too. But we have to be firmer, I think, and more consistent. So thank you. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers and the Delphi Forum for hosting us. And I hope to see you next year in Delphi, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. That would be lovely. Thank you. Look forward to meeting all thank of you in person then. Yes, yeah. indeed.